Welcome to this edition of the Million Dollar Mastermind Podcast. This is where we pick the brains of high achievers from all walks of life and get their hard-earned, real-world insights on winning. I'm your host, Larry Wydell. The thing is that, uh, what do you say, what are you doing now? Other than, you know, speaking and this and that and the other and whatever, what's your main, do you have a job? Are you in, I a, do. in a company? I work. And what I is it? Full, I work full time for EXP Realty. They're the they're publicly owned. They're the largest independently owned uh, residential real estate company in the U.S. and the world. They're in they're operating in like twenty two countries or maybe even more now. And so, three of the indicators you look at about how large real estate companies are, we're the largest in two of those, and we're the fourth largest in the third category. And wow. so, I help build products and technology that our agents use, and I you know run those operations and roll that out leading teams while doing a lot of writing and talking with gentlemen like you, men and women that have audiences. While like the best way to tell the war stories and grow my current team is sharing the stories about what we're actually doing. So people show up to war every day because I show up when we're working 50 hours and 60 hours trying to grow that company. And they hear me say the same things publicly that I'm telling them behind the scenes. And that kind of makes us all work a little bit harder. And so tell me what your schedule is like. You're up in the mountains. It's behind, getting ready to go into the uh, holiday weekend. And so where do you spend your time and how do you spend your time? Well, I've been blessed by genes to not have to sleep very much. And so wow. that came from my dad's side. So I'm usually up at 3.30, maybe 4 o'clock every day. I start shutting down usually around 9, but I'm usually not asleep until close to 11 or 12. So I do a lot of reading in the evenings, but um, spend a lot of time with my wife and kids after hours. But I usually hit the gym first thing in the morning when I can. I haven't so much the last couple months because yeah. we've been working th- uh, on some really big projects. We have some patent pending stuff coming out. But other than that, I'm usually up at the gym first thing in the morning, come back to the house before my wife and kids are up so I can help. We have two littles at home, a four-year-old and a two-year-old. Oh, congratulations. So, thank you. Thank you. They, uh, it's amazing how humbling having kids are. I always heard that from my friends, but it's different yeah. when you experience it. Yeah. Yeah. I always thought that, you know, you can get your master's and your PhD, but I always thought you get you get your college degree in life when you get married. You get your master's with the first child and your PhD with the second child. <laughs> you find out you don't know anything about anything, you know? It's just, it's, it's amazing. Problem yeah. solving. And, Problem solved. Yeah. So that, oh. that's how most of my days start. I mean, I'm usually at one of my desks. I, mean, I am at our mountain property in North Georgia right now in Blairsville. We also have a house in Roswell, uh, just north of Atlanta. And so I'm usually at my desk by 8 a.m. And so it's great to not have a commute. I mean, my commute is walking right. downstairs or down here is our tree house. It's about 25 foot off the ground. It's a full separate house by itself. And so I go in there and um, with Starlink, I've got great a- uh, Wi-Fi access here. And um, I can just separate out from everybody else and wait till my team starts getting online. I always have a gentleman on my team, Michael, who uh, no matter what hour I choose to get to my laptop, somehow he is at his laptop an hour before me, I find. Wow. Wow. What a godsend. Now, yeah. talk about just, I'm just curious, when you get this project, you've been working on a couple of projects, and when you implement them, where are they going to be implemented in and how will they make a difference? So they are in two different places. And so I'm in one of the areas I run is enterprise SEO. So it's in our case, like how do you get more traffic than a Zillow or some of these large yeah. portals that are out there? Right. And so it's kind of traditional marketing with SEO, but we have to build proprietary technology of this big technology stack to do that. At this point, we have the largest residential real estate website in America, the most number of listings from all the data and checks we've done. And so that takes a lot of time working with product teams and building that. So my customers for that are actually, if you're looking for a new house, yeah. like you're one of my customers. So how do we show up on Google and another agent bring it in? But we build a lot of tools for the internal 78,000 agents within the US. I think we're at about 88,000 globally, maybe more. And so I build tools like I built an internal agent referral tool when an, one EXP agent is making a referral to another EXP agent because a client's moving across country. Well, that used to take up to 45 minutes to make that referral. It now takes 45 seconds or less. Like wow. that's a huge time saver, really from a, I have a belief that a lot of time there's cool technology. I build some of the cool technology and then there's technology like that where 
I think technology should solve grunt work. And my yeah. job is to hear and see what is actually going on in those customers' lives, which in that case are internal customers, and then go, well, you roll it out. But the biggest thing there from a scaling and growth isn't building the technology. It's continuing to get it adopted, which we talked about earlier as influencers. Right. I can go tell people all day long, instead of 45 minutes, it takes you 45 seconds and there'll be adoption and I get some people. When I go start telling the stories of the people actually using it right. and or what they're able yeah. to do instead, I mean, I can watch the growth happen. Yeah. Yeah, people follow the leader. And it's like, even in our company, it's just like, you've got to have someone do something great and significant with an idea, a product or whatever. And then everybody wants to follow them, you know? And uh, it's the same thing with the, that's what the influencer type world is. Now, I've got another question for you. I'm not going to keep you forever, but you made the statement that I want to do more keynote speaking. What caused you to reach that thought in your life and say, this would be, because, you know, obviously it'd be fun, but why did you come to that conclusion or what caused you to reach that conclusion? I've always been blessed to be in a place with transformation and innovation where at industry events, like because of what my teams have been able to accomplish, people ask you to come speak at those industry events. You don't get paid for those, but they're yeah. great for selling the company and sharing with others. And then I had a fraternity brother reach out from PPAI was one of my early ones, the, uh, the performance product industry and said, hey, look, we have a big leadership conference for everybody who runs the companies in our industry. We need a keynote speaker. Would, you know, I put your name in, would you like to have that conversation? It was a nice paycheck, but the better thing was the follow-ups from that because I was able to step in and talk about building companies through servant leadership and growing companies better and faster by treating people differently. Yeah. And the follow-ups that happened from that, convert, from that first paid keynote was incredible. I had CEOs and presidents and chief operating officers sending me notes still two years later about changes they implemented from, I didn't know I could change how I treat people and it would affect the bottom line in such a positive way. Yeah. Um, my pe they, it's not, One person sent me a note, they're like, I was told I'm not an asshole anymore and my numbers are better. And he uh, had a big company. And I was like, hearing that, I'm like, there's a place where you get into, there's nothing wrong with executive coaching, but usually so many executive coaches, they don't actually do things. I don't have time with my day-to-day -day life to be an executive coach too much. But right. if I come in from a keynote speaking, I'm able to bring some insights to how I've built companies, tell the stories of people I've worked with, like Judson Green. That's a way that it seems like the results I hear back from the outcomes of people, like that's why I'm more interested in doing more of it. And it, it's almost industry-wide too. Yeah, industry-wide. Well, in a lot of different industries, because like I mentioned at Navtech, we were at the linchpin of, of 11 different industries using spatial data. So I have that stories where I've sp spoken in automotive companies. I've spoken um, behind the scenes, you know, at video game companies, public companies, all sorts of these things. And the way you grow companies and operate and scale is really, it's the same in almost every industry. There's things in regulations that I'm sure I don't know in healthcare, for instance. But right. outside of some of the regulation things, still how you set up teams to grow and scale. I mean, I've learned, I've done the zero to 1 million thing, the zero to 10 million thing. I'm that scaler though. And so that's a very different thing when people have a lot of pieces on the chessboard and you're able to step in and say, look, I'm not here to get a monthly con uh, coaching gig. I'm here to just share some stories and help change you change perhaps the way you approach those conversations and the stories that come back afterwards. And so like, I mean, it's nice. My wife and I get to go travel to some wonderful places because of it. But it's really the because of the stories of transformation I hear afterwards. For those of you who are sick and tired of fooling around and are dead serious about wanting to move up fast, I've got something especially for you. I've combined the best insights from over 40 years in business and making $70 million in income and compress them into a free webinar. That's right, it's a free resource. If you want to find out exactly what the concepts are that I use in coaching million dollar earners, register now at widelonwinning.com. You'll discover the five part framework used by so many to reach their financial, personal, and professional goals. You can find that link in this episode's show notes. And the when you, regardless of the industry you go to, 
and speak. The main takeaway that you want them to have, or one of the main takeaways would be how they treat people or this and the other, or what would you, you know, I'm sure that's it's important, but what would you say is the main takeaways that you want to brand in their mind uh, through your stories and whatever? Yeah, I most of the time I come in and I end up speaking about the titles, of course, will be different depending on industry right. and problems they're trying to address. But it, I'm trying to get people to adopt high achieving servant leadership. So often I see companies held back where to me, it is really binary. There's times where you do need to be authoritarian. You do need to tell people exactly what's on your mind and what they need to do in that moment. But I'm really, there's a very binary, it's a yes or a no of, look, you're either the micromanager that leads by authority only, or you lead through high achieving servant leadership. And to me, that is very different than most books and most people that talk about servant leadership. I'm a strong man of faith and I know, but most books on servant leadership, most people that have spoken about it when you underlie and you read their books, it's because they come from a faith perspective or they think it's morally the right way to treat their people. Yeah. And I do agree with that, but I though look much more at people like the only book that I really like love about this is Cheryl Backhelder. She speaks about servant leadership. She was a change CEO for Popeye's Louisiana Kitchen, took that comp public company out of bankruptcy basically and made it hugely profitable. And her whole book is basically saying, look, and this is what I believe. If you want to grow a company faster and higher than you ever could, you can't be an authoritarian leader. You have to do it as a servant leader, where my job is to look at and go, I need to show up every day and go, look, I may, I may actually know the best thing to be done, but my job is to not tell that to you. It's to teach you how to do that and replicate myself. Because there's so many decisions that need to be made, especially as organizations grow, where there's no way any authoritarian leader can make all the decisions, even if he or she is right, even right. if you can make the best. But most people, the best bosses, you hear somebody, they've read every Simon Sinek book out there, and they go, I'm a nice person. And if you go look at their meetings and their interactions with their direct reports and how they lead their companies, yeah. it really comes down to do what I say or I'm going to fire you. Yeah. As opposed to, I'm trying to, as opposed to, Try to replicate yourself, teach your people wisdom and how to make decisions so that if you got hit by a bus, they would operate without you. Right. Because you really only have a business when the business can operate without you. And there is too much of uh, the problem with the Moses style of leadership where you come down from the mountain, you're continually walking down from the, the mountain with 10 more commandments. Right. <laughs> every week. It's like, oh, no, 10 more commandments. And uh, the thing is, when people are involved, we found a long time ago that if they, you know, you have a problem. I got to the end of my run in running the, the big organization where I would just notice, I'd get to the point where I said, we got a problem coming up here. And I would right. go I'd get my team together. I said, hey, we got a problem. Now we can keep doing what we're doing now, or we can, you know, and we're going to kind of grind to a halt, or uh, right. maybe there's something we can do better. What do you guys think? And if, right. whatever they came up with, you know, a lot of times you could steer them over towards what you know is the right way to go. But even if they come up with a mediocre idea, there is going to be more successful than anything that you try to cram down their throat because they've got a vested interest in it. But how would you describe, uh, and I'll, I'm going to let you off the hook with this, is to understand high achieving servant leadership, because, you know, you could take and twist that to servant leadership, but we got to have the numbers, you know? <laughs> well, you I'm trying to, I am trying to hit the numbers, but part of that is I'm not, instead of telling my, instead of telling the people that work for me, what exactly I need to do, I'm explaining to them the outcomes and the results that we're trying to achieve as a company. And yeah. often what, in way, what I mean, heck, even if it's a, a Ruby on Rails software engineer, what you're doing, here's the outcomes that we're hoping from what you're coding today and how right. that's going to feed into this bigger picture yeah. so that he or she can make the decisions that, that they need to do, not to do exactly what I told them, but to do the things that they think is going to help us get to that outcomes and change the dynamic. I mean, you asked about what my day looks like. Well, I only discuss until I get to my desk. I mean, I really look back. I'm, I try to be very judicious with my time. And I'm always looking at, I'm always trying to do things that in my mind, I'm the only person uh, capable of doing today. Right. Some cases that's experiments, yeah. some cases it's strategy. And then I'm looking at, is there anything I've done today that I need to be teaching somebody in my team how to do tomorrow? 
Then Absolutely. tomorrow I'll right. bring them up next to me. And then the next day I'm handing off more things to them so I can keep experimenting and doing things that only I can do. As oh. an example, I mentioned I'm, I'm leading a rolling out some patent pending technology now. Well, we have software engineers that are building it. We have a product manager that's helped building it. I work with him very intimately on some of the new features. I'm the one leading the mastermind with hundreds of our agents that are trying this because I have a way of being able to speak into them that's just not replicatable right now. Right. But I always have both my product manager and my head of product marketing alongside of me because it's hard to speak and hear at the same time. Right. And so they're actually able to come back and teach back to me to say, look, it's patent pending because it doesn't exist anywhere else in real estate. So I do not have seven words or 17 words that if I say it, the average real estate agent would understand this right. is what it does. And so I'm leading a every week mastermind with hundreds of some of the highest performing agents in the country while they experiment with using early access technology. And then they're listening for where there's confusion when I yeah. say something and somebody asks questions or somebody comes back afterwards so that we can try to make that mastermind better. I couldn't do that by myself. I have to do that with them. And I'm yeah. open and vulnerable with them to say, they will listen to me because of my background, but I can't teach them to be successful without their ears and then us conferencing afterwards. Yeah. that In terms of scalable, is you have to have someone on top noticing what's going on, figuring out better ways of getting it done, and then simplifying that into some steps and whatever, and then bringing somebody in... Right. training them, passing it off to them. And in the process, I used to tell people, look, until you get seven to 10 people who can do what you do, you can't move up. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And you, you promote yourself by getting seven to 10 people who can do what you do. Then right. now you can elevate yourself. And yeah. so there's some truth of that in a lot of these situations. And so uh, I'm glad we got that that last got around to giving you the chance to get that last bit in there because that's amazingly powerful right on the money insight for leaders who want to grow and get out of the weeds you know you're going to get into weeds running a business and growing you know growing puts you into the weeds but you get out of the weeds by going through that process that you talked about that I'm not going to repeat because <laughs> you said it so well. And so uh, I'm so glad we got around to that. Thanks so much for sharing. This has been an action packed, uh, fun afternoon. Uh, I appreciate you having me and taking the time and having such wonderful pictures behind you. They're just like captivating. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. I'm a photographer and an artist. These are some of these I'll paint actually over here. I've got them up here. I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to paint them. Anyway, thank you very much. You're very, very kind. And so let's see if we could catch up somewhere down the road and see how X, uh, EXP Realty continues to explode and wipe out Zillow. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody else, there's not many competitors for you at this point. But anyway, I wish you all the best. Thanks so much. Hey, thanks so much, Larry. Well, let's do this. I'm getting sloppy here. I always let my guests say the last word. And to uh, the people who have stayed with us and listened this long, what kind of last word jumps into your mind from the uh, universe and tells you they need to hear? You use the term momentum so many times, I think, throughout our conversation. And I think anybody who's trying to grow an organization, that's the key that they always need to be thinking out. You're not always going to have growth that goes up and to the right as we want, but you need to look back and kind of think about is what I'm doing today building momentum over time? What am I doing that's not scalable? Because we're always doing non-scalable stuff that allows me to find momentum and scale over time. Fantastic. Thanks so very much. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Million Dollar Mastermind. If you felt there were any valuable takeaways from this episode, please take a minute and leave us a five-star review. Your feedback is important and really helps us get the word out to a wider audience. Remember, we have a valuable webinar that is absolutely free. Register for it right now at whiteallenwinning.com. Thanks for listening.